All righty. Welcome back to On the Gravel with your boys, Raven, Raven and Oliver. And Oliver. Uh, long weekend, both of us. A lot of work. A lot of, a lot of homework for your boy. But a lot of news. A lot of good racing. Absolutely. That we didn't really see in Bahrain. A new debutant. There's a lot Dude, to go on so about So much today. to go on about. So we will uh, start that right away. Starting off, I'll let you take this one. So I was, you know, after we released the episode last week, I was going through some news while I was at work um, because I typically work right after we record these on Mondays. And I saw a very interesting headline on Motorsport News that the Turkish GP might be uh, returning for 2026 with the new regs. Now, for those of you that are new to the sport, uh, the Turkish GP was a mainstay on the F1 calendar in the early 2000s into the mid-2010s, specifically from 2005 to 2011. And it came back for a couple years during COVID when we were struggling to, you know, form these long uh, race calendars. And it, we had some cracking races at this track it, in both 2020 and 2021, um, very notable drives from Lewis Hamilton winning his seventh world championship there in 2020 to Sergio Perez's great defense on Lewis uh, at the same track. Um, it's a, it's a track that a lot of people are going to like to go back to. It's a lot, it's a track that a lot of people miss. It's one of Herman Tilka's greatest ever creations. Um, it's, I'd say the most notable section on this track that's very notable is the turn eight to 11 quad apex corner. Um, seeing a car go through that on the onboard is truly a beautiful spectacle. And I don't think a single person will complain about going back to an actual purpose built racing circuit. Cause I know we're having this issue with so many, you know, street track after street track after street track. Going back to a classic, iconic track like this is something everybody's going to be there for. Yeah, and I have the article pulled up right now, and it looks like they're also going to be bringing back Rally Car to the country too, which is mm-hmm. super big. It's just a huge economic boost for all those European countries. So super, super cool about that. Yeah, so uh. the the uh, Mohammed Ben Salim, I'm still pronouncing that wrong, as... Somebody who knows a lot about this guy, I still pronounce his name wrong, but he had his his meeting with the Turkish president last week and it, you know, came across that it went pretty well. So, you know, if you see some headline about Turkey coming back in a couple of years, don't be surprised. Um, I know I won't and I will be very excited for that day. Sticking with some new track news, some uh, shocking renders came from this weekend about a new Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. Oh boy. Dude. Looks like someone really missed Mario Kart and wanted to make it a real thing because dude, I'm thinking of good old Mario Stadium or it might just be Mario Circuit on Mario Kart where, you know, they go up with the planes and everything and you know, they have that little flying section. I don't know if if I'm if I'm Are just you talking waffling, about Mario Kart 8. But yeah, yeah. Okay. In Mario that Kart makes, 8. Yes, um, I know it's like which one. Probably one of my favorite tracks. The but one, right? yeah, but that's like that's what I'm thinking of when I see this track because <laughs> the the first couple corners, you know, you're shooting up this um like very steep incline. This first corner it's like is supposed 150 to be stories, they said. Twenty it's twenty, 20 but stories, that's still two hundred feet. You know, that should be two hundred feet. Just wait till Charles Leclerc uh locks <laughs> break up or break lock <laughs> Breaks lock up and then he uh, flies. He just over. flies straight off. Like that, that'll that just be, be a nice safe. little. <laughs> so, dude, that can't be safe. Like that's no. the only issue because it's not like, you know, you're not going with the the terrain. Like the Saudi Arabian desert is flat, but um, they're they're literally building it up like it's like the Chicago L, just like the platform. Yeah, of that's the L. my thing. Is like it's completely unsafe or if, it looks unsafe. If you look at the pictures of it, it's. It's fine. Like, it, it, in theory, yeah, it'll work. But, like, the thing that really sticks out is on every single track, you will see, like, gravel or yeah. sand or a bunch of different barricades of different types. On those renders, there was mm-hmm. nothing. It was just the corner. The corner itself. and then the curbs and then. And, you know, how are you, how are you really supposed to have runoff when you are building artificial elevation you know like 
that it, it can't be safe and it'll take a lot of refining and engineering to go into that to make it safe but i don't know how i feel about it. like it looks really cool um the the ad they put out was phenomenal but that like dude, there's no way that's going to be a oh safe track God. no absolutely not so sticking with some of the red bull news that has been plaguing us the last few weeks uh, during the ball rain race, Toto Wolf and Jost Verstappen were having a meeting in the paddock. Max was then asked if this meeting meant anything, and his answer was a cryptic version of, well, if Lewis can move out of anywhere, then nothing's impossible. So that is, I think, shocking for a lot of people, just in the sense of now Max, we're seeing yeah just Max like, knows what's going on though I mean, like it, he's it, been it, knowing well what's of course going it does on. but it, it really plays into the fact that he is now sitting there you know thinking about everything that's been going on well I think his Red dad Bull. whispering into his ears a lot of this too but like I that's do true. I do think now we are really seeing these Christian Horner events kind of have consequences like some of my next points around this is that even Adrian Newey and Helmut Marco may be looking to leave because of this situation there's already been talks about that max has said if that helmet leaves he's going to be leaving immediately yeah which and helmet doesn't want to get in max's way there's like, so many nuances to this and it, i just think the craziest part is that christian horner has literally come out and stated that if adrian newey max verstappen and helmet marco leave the team will still be as successful as it is right now and he's almost taking full credit Take, for re- remember Ford throw Ford in there uh, too. Ford as well. Yeah. But it's, it's Christian Horner, like t- trying to take full credit for all of the success. Him. It's unbelievable. Like he's I, really, he believes that he's this like architect of su- architect of success, which in, re- don't get me wrong. He's, he's a boss. He is. But, and I can't disdain his credit or, you can't not credit his success. Yeah, but you like know, he's, at the he's same definitely time, a factor. I don't think he's the sole purpose. Obviously, he's not. So I feel like if you if you had to pick one key figure from Red Bull, it's, it's Adrian Newey. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's like hands down. I feel like if you understand that the sport is not just solely racing; it's also a mm-hmm. car building competition. It is an engineering competition. At the end of the day, that it's everyone versus Adrian Newey, and he just builds a better car, and that's why these guys are winning. Adrian so. Newey. To Ferrari. I'm just kidding. I wish. All right. All right, I'll leave. (laughs) So after this situation, Red Bull, in theory, could have two new drivers within the next three years Mm -hmm. after total domination of the last four, which do they take in some new rookies? Do they bring up some guys from their youth program? Do they or bring on our they... favorite rookie, Fernando Alonso? Yeah, that's, that was going to be my next statement, is do they bring on the GOAT of all time, greatest rookie ever? Or does somebody like Carlos Sainz make a return to the Red Bull family? Like, that's a very real possibility, given Genuinely, his, his dad. Ferrari contract's ex- well, now terminated. Yeah, but... and, and his dad's allegiance to... Yeah. Uh, Helmut Marco is being investigated now as well. This has kind of been seen as a shock. I don't feel like people fully understand why he's being investigated right now, but yeah, I feel like everything in Red Bull is just going to be investigated as a result of Christian Horner being stupid. Yeah. Uh, FIA is also being <laughs> investigated. Being Everybody's being investigated. So this one's very important. This though, one is important. This one kind of came out of nowhere, and a lot of eyes were shot at Ben Salim, mm-hmm. where I don't think they personally should have been. Tuesday, the FIA said that they really received two complaints detailing potential allegations involving certain members of its governing body, which everyone believes to be targeted at the president, Mohammed yeah. bin Salim. It's alleged that there was all related to a claim that he allegedly intervened to overturn a penalty that was given to Alonzo last year at the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. The other is that he told officials not to certify the Las Vegas circuit for its high profile race in November. Like we said, this has all been alleged. It could be anyone in the body, but because he's the president, he's obviously an easy target. So, but you know, like when I saw this, I, it immediately took me back to, Oh, this is a Michael Massey like intervening and twisting rules. Um, Abu Dhabi 2021. 
Um, but you know, it, I don't think, you know, it comes off as like, okay, he's sitting there and he's interfering with race results when, you know, maybe he's having conversations with the stewards because this penalty, um, I guess a bit of like detail about the specific penalty. It was a penalty that was given to Fernando Alonso last year where he was given a five second penalty to serve during a pit stop. Um, I can't remember what that penalty was for, but they essentially served the penalty incorrectly. He didn't sit there for five seconds straight. I think he sat there for 4.96 seconds. Um, and then they I touched understand the, it's all a technicality thing, yeah, but come on. But they touched the back of the car. So a uh, little bit later in the race, he gets given a further 10 seconds of penalties, which means he loses a podium to George Russell. And then... You know, out of nowhere, a day later, 24 hours later, this penalty is overturned. And there's a photo online of George Russell, like mailing the trophy back to Fernando Alonso. Um, you know, I guess it is up to interpretation, but, you know, the numbers are the numbers. And if the penalty was served incorrectly, then I think that should have been George Russell's podium. And I agree. It, but you know, it kind of like fogs the line of, you know, what is and what is not. So, you know, it, it'll set a bad precedent if, you know, more and more stuff like this comes out, you know, Saudi 2023, Abu Dhabi 2021, that's it, where it's I not th- a good look for the FIA and F1 as a whole. So, yeah, that's where I think one of these is more on like being the governing body of the racers and then also just being the central business that's kind of taking in the business side of F1. Yeah, because the second one is I feel like kind of the more alarming one where Mm -hmm. if he's if they already have a contract agreement to be the high profile race of november and then he's being like no i don't want to certify them because personally i don't think the race it's a good circuit or it's a good venue for whatever reason i just don't think it's valid i think that's kind of not your role it's not his role it's like obviously but like I don't know whose role would then that be in a sense where it's like, if I it's guess a governing like, body too. It's it's the governing body and then the race organizers. But you know, how much of a part of the governing body is he like, is he the final say, does he have like the veto power, that kind of thing? I mean, if he does, then what he's doing is completely okay. But I don't really know where he actually falls into that just on top of being like a massive investor like that kind of thing. Like, I don't actually know the credentials and um, abilities he has as the president of F1. God, it's, it's just a crazy business side of the inside of F1 right now. Yeah. Continuing on, we had the talks of MotoGP's bidding rights being up in limbo right now. Liberty Media is one of those companies, the company that owns F1, are bidding right now. I believe something I read was like 4.3 million euros, I said, or billion euros or something. Yeah. Um, I don't personally think this would be a good acquisition by F1 just because I feel like they would do the thing of not giving it its own spotlight and making it just something a part of the race weekend almost. Like a F1 Academy kind of thing. Yeah, or like, uh, like oh, this week we'll have, instead of a Formula 2 race, we'll have the MotoGP race happening. Yeah, because you can't, I would not want them to, or I, that's a horrible idea. Like yeah. having, you know, Moto Beach, MotoGP be another supporting series every single weekend. You know, you already have F1 and then you have Formula 2, Formula 3, and F1 Academy being the supporting series. Like, there's no room for MotoGP. I think you leave it to the people that have it right now. I don't want F1 to interject and potentially ruin the sport. Yeah, I will say the one thing... Or Liberty, my apologies. The one thing I would say would be nice is if uh, the MotoGP had, like, the feature on the race, because I was watching the race highlights, and it's like, doesn't tell you how far they are from each other, which it's kind of hard to kind of keep up with if you're not really paying attention if you're not to into numbers. motorcycles <laughs> not really i mean you can see yeah. the the results happening in front of you but like yeah. not how f1 where it's like there's a count co- constant counter yeah of like 
where they you just are have in the position in MotoGP. Yeah, and so I feel like there's small stuff like that where that improvement would be seen, but at the same time, I do think it would just be kind of made into the sideshow aspect of yeah the racing, which not exactly what we would really want. Last bit of uh, general paddock news. Audi confirms total rebranding of Sauber in 2026. And all I can say is, thank God, we don't have to see the stake F1. F1 team Sauber kick oh, gambling so happy, team. So happy to get rid of that. So Yeah, I know there were some concerns on if Audi was going to pull out or not. But I'd rather have Ford pull out than Audi pull out. Racing. Um, yeah, of racing, of racing. <laughs> of racing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you sent me up there. Um, I did not say, no, no, I did not do that. I did not do that. Yeah, I think there was a lot of talks just because of everything that was happening and with Sauber's legal issues for a little yeah. bit. People were thinking that was going to dissuade Audi from really rebranding the team and trying to get their foot in the door. I know the Andrade uh, Cadillac thing also was a huge aspect for them where people were going to be kind of wondering if they were going to do that or not. So, yeah, that was it. But getting over to the main event of the weekend. Well, not Friday. This was then Thursday for practice. That's my bad. But starting off, Carlos Sainz. Thank God you survived appendicitis, but also thank God that you left so that we could see some beautiful action by From our young, Behrman. young gun, Oliver Behrman. But we'll get into that in a little bit. Car- yeah. Yeah. Carlos left FP1. Um, Feeling very, very unwell in the car. Said it was his hardest day ever in, F- in an F1 car. Um, so I'm not surprised he left to get that fixed. You know how bad it was with Alex Albon uh, two years ago, so... That doesn't surprise me whatsoever, but yeah, it. We'll get there soon. We'll get there soon. I don't want to get excited about it yet. But F- Fernando Alonso was looking right at home during these first few days of practice, finishing P two at FP one and topping FP two as well. God, he the was Aston Martin quick. hype train came back. It did. It definitely came back this weekend. And we'll talk about it during the race, but race pace didn't look terrible either. So yeah pretty happy with that i mean you got a lot of race runs in fp1 fp3 you got a lot of your qualifying runs in fp2 and he looked good in both of them so yeah uh charles was complaining about bags on the circuit like they were like bananas plastic on, bags like they were bananas in mario yeah. kart so there's you saw a something. lot of this in practice i saw it in qualifying we saw it during we the race on too. the race we as well. saw one and we're like ah that's lame uh, Mercedes and Toto believe that they aren't competing to win this race. Yeah, no. Yeah. That's an obvious piece of information. Thank you for the great commentary, Toto. There's that, but there's that preseason, you know, false sense of hype. You know, it looked like Mercedes was going to be that potentially oh, the fight car looks Ferrari. fast this year. Yeah, the like they, they thought it was really good. And, you know, so far going into practice in Saudi Arabia, they were looking like, I mean, with Fernando Alonso existing, potentially the fifth best car this weekend. So don't believe what you see in preseason testing. Yeah. <laughs> It'll, it, it can all fall apart so quickly. Zhao had a weird spin and crashed into the wall during FP3. He was fine, but... Reminded me of Mick Schumacher and yeah. qualifying in 2022. Just shows how difficult this track really is. And it people don't really understand. This is the fast, second fastest track on yep. the total circuit grid just behind monza it's also the fastest street track yeah it's the fastest street track second fastest track period behind monza and has the most corners i learned that yeah corners is is a uh corners is an overstatement it's an overstatement okay this is this (laughs) is not a corner okay you can say it's a corner all you want it's not a corner uh qualifying i'll let you take this friday the main event Carlos Sainz, it's you know, not the main event. The race is the main event. <laughs> hey, it's the main event for me as for a Ferrari Friday. fan. For Friday as well, yes. So Carlos Sainz um, withdraws from the race weekend. You think, okay, who's going to replace him? You had a couple uh, candidates to replace him. I'd say your two biggest ones, 
Robert Schwartzman, and Oliver Behrman. Everybody's willing on for Ali Behrman. Who am I kidding? Nobody's willing. It just happened out of nowhere. Ali Behrman is thrown into the Ferrari. This kid's 18 years old, the third youngest debutant of all time behind Max Verstappen and Lance Stroll. You know, if you're talking about a young gun, if you're talking about young hands, and with the regulations now, you are never going to get a younger kid in the car than Oliver Behrman. Well, Lance Stroll, but... <laughs> and Max Verstappen. No, no, Max Verstappen, um, he was 17 years old and 166 days old when he started in an F1 car. They put out a new rule... Oh, you to have to be prevent, 18. You have to be 18 years old um, to prevent a Max Verstappen situation from ever happening again. But Which is so crazy, because like NBA tried to do the same thing. Now. But look at him now. It's like... So are you trying to block the extreme growth of a driver to keep the betterment of your series? Is that what I'm hearing, Oliver? I, I don't know because it's like, okay, so if I'm thinking about Max Verstappen in, in you know, 2014, 15, 16, because 2015 was his debut year, um, like the way he went through the ranks, because he went from karting to European Formula 3 to F1. So he was karting in 2013 and he was in in an F1 car in 2015. Um, but person, he was also doing other yes. racing. Yeah, but his main discretion was karting. Was karting wow. Um, like the CZK championship, that kind of thing. Um, and then European F3, he had one season in Formula cars before he went to F1. And the person that reminds me of the most now is Kimi Antonelli. That kid is, you know, he skipped all of F3. He went straight from... Um, Italian F4 straight into uh, into an F2 car. And, you know, are you really going to block a young talent like that? It's, you know, with how much hype is behind him, you had the same amount of hype behind Max Verstappen at that time. Um, so I think it's I think it's a bit of BS. But getting back to Oliver Behrman, he had his one practice session, uh, FP3. He looked, he looked decent, you know, nothing to write home about, but it's his first hour in an F1 car where he knows, okay. Also, I'm he qualified in, in F2 the day before. He People took pole don't... position. He took pole position in the F2 uh, qualifying the day before, and then immediately finds out the next day that he's going to be driving in an not F1 only car. like free practice three, but, but then qualifying and the race as well. So, for him to get out there and within 36 hours, not only fight behind you know, the Mercedes mm -hmm. in Q3, but just to absolutely every, like, I don't know if, if anyone was watching, you would have heard, uh, one of the announcers, I forget which one off the top of my head, but, um, I'm going to guess it's Alex Jakes. No, it was, I think they were talking about, um, just how it's like, no matter who you're a fan of, it's like Oliver Behrman better be your like number one driver of the day. Oh Yeah. That's so. that's Alex Jakes. Um, yeah, so he has his one hour of practice. It's a decent hour of practice. And he goes into qualifying. Boss is Q1. No issue with that. In Q2, he kind of messes up his first run. And it puts him on the back foot. Uh, he does his second run. And he gets knocked out in Q2. But by three hundredths of a second to Lewis Hamilton. Like he was three hundredths of a second um, not away from not even just making Q3, but knocking Lewis Hamilton out. Like, which I think is a bigger thing. Like, I, it totally is <laughs> to be up there with those guys and to just be proving making the most of this situation is very impressive. Like, it's true. Like, you have to think Ferrari is a team that values experience over anything. And the, the way you know this is Oliver Behrman is the first driver to debut in F1 with Ferrari in 52 years. Just like insane. nobody's first race in an F1 car is with Ferrari. Who was the last driver? I, uh, I have no idea. It was 1972. Um, but yeah, so to have all of that pressure on his shoulders to be that young um, and to come in and really do that work and put his foot down was really impressive. And, you know, he's in a Ferrari. Qualifying P11 is not the end of the world. Um, he can definitely make a lot of places back in the race. You had slower cars ahead of him. Um, and we'll get to that soon. He definitely did make those places up. Some of them were 
a bit fortunate, but he he definitely made genuine overtakes and worked his way through that race and really made the Ferrari bosses proud. I like just from this weekend alone, um, I can almost guarantee you will see um you'll see Oliver Behrman in an F1 car next year. But yeah, off the top, I don't actually know who the last one was. Yeah, I'm trying to find. I see so many different names, but uh, was it? You said it was 52 years. 50, so that, 1972 season. So that doesn't make sense. I'm seeing 1951 right. It's now. okay. It's not important. All that's all that's important is that it's it's been that long, um, and you know he's the first one to do it. But you know, if we're going back to you know him getting knocked out by Lewis Hamilton in qualifying, let's take a second to actually talk about Lewis Hamilton. And Mercedes as a whole, because we, you know, we talked about it in pra- in practice, but Mercedes didn't look good whatsoever in qualifying trim. George Russell had a better time than Lewis Hamilton, but, you know, Lewis doesn't really have as much to, to race for, um, you know, like George Russell does. Um, but Arturo Marzararo. Nineteen. <laughs> Mazzario? Mazzario, Mazzararo, I don't know. I'm not good. It's I don't hard. There's Italian. 97 drivers to have driven for Ferrari before. So if this guy's one of them, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, it sounds like he is. 1972. But yeah, so maybe Lewis Hamilton knocked Ollie Behrman out of qualifying, but he struggled to do so. God, let's um, talk about those Alpines being so slow for a second <sighs> in, in qualifying. Like I, I saw the thing. It. I don't want to get into that again, but well, we I have saw to. the thing. We have to. Yeah, we have to. We're F one show. Uh, <laughs> I saw the thing where it was like Alonzo. I think it was Miami of last year. Yep. Where they were doing practice or qualifying, and he's doing a hot lap, and the Alpines are in front of him. Yeah. And he just talks back to his radio engineer, and it's like, "Don't worry, this is their moment to shine." <laughs> They're not having any moments to shine this year. Oh man, I feel so bad for. So bad for them. Oh, I didn't do my... I was going to do a bit where I was going to write like a Jimmy Fallon, Dear Alpines Investors, but I did not do that. So Dude, I will who say, am I I will say We're going to have bit. the chance to do that next week. I will Anyways. save that bit and we will do a little like cold open with me writing something on the wall or something. I don't know. We'll make something fun out of it. You see that? Yeah, we're going to take some crayons out. <laughs> we're going to draw right on the wall behind us. And that's going to be the new backdrop <laughs> for the show every single week. Every week. Just you wait. We're going to paint it and do it again. It's just going to turn into an ab- <laughs> dumpster fire behind us. Uh, do you want to take a quick break and then we'll go into the race? Yeah, I think the race definitely deserves its own its own open. And then we'll get into all of the other uh, discretions of racing as well as our some things that we saw. Our which, top five and not five. Which we will update the list to make sure there's we're actually five best. things. I was going to say, we're doing our best to make that a real thing now. Because so, I really like the bit. I do. I think it's fun. It gives us something to do. And eventually we'll have like a cool graphic that welcomes us to the bit. But yes, we sir. are going to be right back, everyone. All right. Welcome back from the short break, everyone. Oh, we'll get right into the race. First things first. A clean first lap. I think that's the most important thing to say. Yeah, you and then immediately it didn't come clean because Alpine's very own Pierre Gasly had a gearbox issue in their tractor of a car. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, he was literally complaining about it on the formation lap. He was actually struggling to get back to the grid. Um he fixed it though. He was. He, I think he was stuck in like first gear or something. He made it back to the grid. They started the race, and then yeah, like two minutes, like yeah, literally two minutes in. We need you to box and retire the car <sighs> when you're P twenty one in a twenty car championship. <laughs> <laughs> Teamwork at Haas was absolutely incredible during the race. That was something that we all kind of saw and were like, "Oh, what are they cooking down at the bottom there?" If good old Ollie Behrman did not exist, Kevin Magnuson. Easy driver of the day. Yeah. Easily. Uh, well, I would say no, just because of, uh, didn't he get a penalty after the race? Yeah. The, the but, contact? Yes, he had multiple penalties, mm-hmm. but taking all, like, oh, sacrificing. Yeah, he, had 20, he had 20 seconds. He had 20 seconds penalty, but you're, you're sacrificing yourself to get, to get that, that to point get for your team. A point. A not, single point. 
So not, this, this ain't this ain't even for a win, dude. This is for <laughs> one point. <laughs> A lot of penalties, but not much action, in my opinion. I feel like you have the similar take as on that as well. I don't think so. I don't think it was a crazy amount of attacking action. I think there was a lot of defensive action. Um, I Lando think it, got kind of screwed over, but I wouldn't say Lando's screwed over. He did strategy sucked. I well, think strategy it, sucked, but also the weave in in and out. Yeah, where he was defending, I believe Lewis. Um, yeah, that was. Not safe and not smart. But hey, we did have a big piece of action um, uh, with a big crash from our favorite, favorite golfer, Lance Stroll. Tennis player. Golf. Yeah. It was golf, a bit of a. Golf uh, is uh, Lando. It was a bit of a uh, shocker, but. We can't uh, watch the kip clip, sadly, but we can listen to the clip. So we have that pulled up right We can here. most definitely listen to this. This is what uh, Lance said right after he crashed into the wall with his race engineer. Hit the wall. Okay, can you bring it back, Lance? No. <laughs> no. <Which laughs> at 1130 in the morning for us was so, so funny. funny <laughs> to just be like, did, did you? I mean, it's a genuine question. Yes. Can you? Because he can't see, he just knows that he crashed the car. Yeah, but you have all this data. As that's as what I'm like saying too. It's like you have all these data points where it's like, <laughs> no, oh, the Dave, right front tire is gone, no, <laughs> or the left front Dave, tire is gone. David Coulthard put it so well. It's like you you're looking at the screens and you see zero car speed. <laughs> <laughs> like where else could he be? <laughs> yeah, don't they also have like? That's a good point. Do they have a little like GP? S kind of trackers to show where they are on the, on the track. Yeah, and they show them during the race. I know that, but like, like I didn't know if that's like a post thing or if that's something like actually in the cars. Okay, please tell me how it's a post thing when the race is live. Just because I'm, just, I'm kidding, but I was gonna say that, like, no, that's they, a really stupid if, if com. You, because if you look at <laughs> every every event, horrible has a post. com. No, <laughs> if you look at um, because they'll do shots of it like during the race all the time. When you look. Um, or they pan the camera over to the engineers and you see like the 20 screens in front of them. There is one that is like straight up just a GPS of the driver that they're tracking. Nice. Okay. Um, so I yeah, know that one of them is exists. also a radar, but you don't need yes. that in Saudi Arabia. The only rain you're getting there is the uh, man-made rain. Hey, dude, rain. I mean, you needed it in Bahrain for preseason testing during F2 yeah. because apparently it decided to monsoon in the desert, but... Global warming isn't real. Global warming is not. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pissed stop issues for McLaren and Sauber. Both Zhao and Botas got absolutely screwed. Zhao yeah. got screwed on the last lap. He got back out there. I think he was going into it in like P14 or something. Yeah. And then comes out dead last 20 seconds behind Valtteri. Botas just got kind of screwed. He had a Like little, he always does. He had a little contact in the beginning of the race. He got called back early pit. Changed mm -hmm. the tires and then just couldn't really maintain pace at all. And then you had one for Lando Norris. This his wasn't race altering, but it was definitely a mistake from the the McLaren pit crew. Um, yeah, I didn't expect to see so many botched pit stops. But yeah, that's going to be one of the points in our next and favorite segment. Top five or not five. Top five or not five is Top back. Five or not five. Took a little break in Bahrain, but she's back. And she's ready to go. An actual top five and not five. Let's get into it. Ollie Behrman, absolute showing of a debut. He was the F1 driver of the day, undisputedly. And that I think kid was on rails. P11 to P7. I think everyone's okay with that, too. And... Well, I think the most the most notable thing that he did during that race, you know, obviously other than making up those four places, was actually the defense that he showed against Lando and Lewis chasing on the soft tires at the end. He did really, like, really well. Like that was well. a, you know, they said I think there was maybe twelve laps left, and uh, you know they they needed seconds. to make up. Yeah, he had like six seconds. You know, very doable to make up five tenths a lap um, on the soft tires, but you had the good fortune of Lewis and Lando fighting each other during that and it took a little bit of pressure off Ollie but he still you know he still had to pump those laps in, and he put a lot of personal bests in uh close to the very end of the race so 
he was he was gunning for that P7, and he fully deserved it. That that kid is going to be something in the future, dude. Very I'm exciting. so proud of him. Very exciting to see where he will be. And an actual good thing to look forward to as a Ferrari fan. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Logan Sargent being on our second top five list. Uh, kid just did great. I mean, stuck with Albon up until the end of the race. Really, yeah, nothing super crazy, yeah, but especially after uh, spinning. In qualifying and practice. Yeah. It's just happy to see him doing well, like not struggling out there. It's happy to to actually see what we're expecting out of Logan Sargent. Yes. So I can't complain about that. The The Williams was not a good car this weekend. I, it's not like we were expecting Albon or Sargent to score points, but just the fact that he was keeping up with his teammate, that's all James Vowles wanted. Um, and we got that. So that's something to be very happy about. I'd say besides Ollie Behrman's debut, the the other biggest point in our top five is Kevin Magnuson. That was one of the coolest strategies and just team sacrifices that I've seen in such a long time in the sport to to just fully sacrifice one of your drivers um, for the fate of the team was so cool to watch. Like you had Kevin Magnuson cutting corner after corner, having very questionable defenses of other drivers just to hold them up as much as possible so that Nico Hulkenberg could essentially take that free pit stop, use those new soft tires, speed to the end, and take that last world championship point in the race. And it worked. And it was so cool to see. They are so far leading the bottom of the pack, you could say. That you could say. So, good for them. Oscar Piast really killed it this weekend. Qualifying ahead of Lando Norris, finishing P4 in the race while Lando was a few positions further behind. I mean, they were both on different strategies, but Le- uh, which for the McLaren, I think, is a kind good, of a good thing. Yeah, I was just say, do, don't have the drivers do the same thing and, and try to fight for you know the same points per se, but let these drivers do their own strategies and all of that too. Yeah, and because he qualified and started the race higher, Oscar was entitled to the preferable strategy during true, the race. True. So that obviously worked very well for him. Last point in our top five is Verstappen winning his ninth consecutive race for, I believe, the second time? Could be his third time doing this. This is his second time winning nine races in a row. Can you stop ruining the fun, please? Hey, it's it'll, it'll come back. We didn't see... I mean, besides the overtake of Perez... In the yeah. beginning to get into second place, we didn't see a single Red Bull. Yeah, Perez overtaking Until the very Leclerc. Last lap. That was it. That was the only overtake we saw from a Red Bull, other than lapping every car. But dude, that was <laughs> really funny to see them cut to the very last, <laughs> like him coming over the line, and then there's just yeah, and you've four got you've got the K, you've got the K Mag train, and Max is just <laughs> coming up so behind and just funny. screw it. Oh, uh, so congrats to him. Good for him. You can't you can't hate on success because you'll you'll look back on it one day and you'll appreciate it. Exactly. Uh, going over to our not five. No, oh, number one, bro. Camera at turn one and two. I don't know what happened to it. I think I personally think it's a white balance issue, and because yeah, a lot of had, memes came out about this. Oh, so many, but. I think it was because the white balance was off and that the color balance was more focused on the advertisements behind them, which was yeah. orange and red or uh, yellow and red. And you have an orange car in front of that, which I was going to say it showed on the McLaren more than any other car. It The McLaren looked like a Ferrari. The McLaren was Ferrari red, which not OK. Can't disrespect the McLaren papaya like that. <laughs> Second not five point is us making a mistake on air. Oliver told me the wrong information. I did. I came in today uh, saying that Ali Behrman was the second youngest debutant of all time, and I forgot Lance Stroll existed. He's a pretty forgettable driver sometimes. Like you can't really get mad at me, but yeah, that was my bad. <laughs> oh, I, no, I'm in the wall. <laughs> oh, oh, and you know, speaking of that, Lance Stroll forgetting where the wall was. <laughs> <laughs> We're used to this with this guy, but he does like driving into the walls. Yeah, he just he had that unlucky Nick DeVries esque tap of the wall like he had last year. Singapore. Uh Azerbaijan last oh. year where he tapped the wall and just yeah. flew off. Like that's exactly what it looked like. But you know, it sucked that he shockingly, shockingly was not able to bring the car back to the garage. But it's a cruel world. 
But it, it just sucks to see the the Lance Stroll inconsistency. Like that's what is actually disappointing about it for me. Because I think Lance on his day is phenomenal. So Lance to have, on his day is one of the like, I mean, it's hard to say. If he's qualifying he's, in the hard. wet, dude, is dude, this is a is killer. Yeah, at but it. it's hard to say like, oh, he's one of the best drivers on the grid. He's it, not. No, he's not. But also, these are the top twenty drivers in the world. Yeah. So. You can't say that he's not a good driver. Yeah, like, like that. That he he despaired compared to claim. compared to, you know, everybody else in racing. Compared to every Chicago driver, he's, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, he's objectively one of the, the best drivers in the world. Yeah. Um, so respect where respect is due. Uh, Daniel Ricardo was. Literally nowhere this week. Get weekend. that guy a map, bro. Like he was, uh, he looked really good on the first day of practice, um, finishing P4 in FP1. But, you know, after that, he kind of fell off a cliff. Yuki Sonoda out quali- I mean, yeah, Yuki Sonoda made it into Q3. Daniel Ricciardo was knocked out in Q2. He was multiple tenths behind him. Um, you know, you had Yuki fighting for points the entire race. Daniel was part of that, like, you know, he was part of the Kevin Magnuson train. Um, so I like I don't want to say the whole Ricardo's washed thing because I don't think he's washed. I just I just don't think he's what he used to I be. I don't think I don't he think fully, he's bad. I don't think he fully has gotten back from when he left Red, Red Bull, Bull yeah. the first time. So like the drive to survive episode on him, I'm not I'm I'm not gonna lie, it was a really good episode. It, yeah. It, explains kind of his thought process and like that period of where he was the reserve driver but kind of just like that third driver marketing yeah the marketing aspect like no one wants to be that so i feel like he's still like he has he has his moments like free practice one like he still shows his greatness that he has or his p4 qualifying in mexico last year like that was great but then race comes and he's struggling. So I, I just don't think he's fully gotten I think, it yet. I don't think he's gone. I don't think he's Botas where it's just like, what is this guy even doing in the sport right now? I mean, and I love Valtteri. Yeah. I think he's just, his age is showing and writing oh, yeah, out his contract type thing. So like Daniel's still relatively young for the drivers, which in the eyes of, you know, a Ferrari maybe or Red he's, Bull, if their situation Red Deepens, Bull is like his only chance. I feel like if he wants to go back to a top team, Red Bull is his only chance. Which in this, so you, th- so but so you, in this situation, be, it's the you best. You think thing. he would be showing off more? Like I think that pressure is like this weekend was a great point because everything is happening now. You have the Max to Mercedes connection. Now you kind have of coming Oliver Behrman being a huge threat. Threat, to yeah. Someone's seat next year or in the years prior, but. I think I think he's going to be in a safer position than he thinks because of all the terminal turmoil that's happening. Both Red Bull spots may be open by the end of the next year. That's true. So it's just so weird to say. It it is, but in reality that's what it is. So I really do think that he could make a return to Red Bull. I think it's more so That's real. If it's he definitely needs real. to just prove it. Prove that he still has it. Prove that he's still capable, and sh- give us a good showing. Give us a P three, maybe P five. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna start getting worried when we're like five, six races into the season, and Bef- I have closer seen to anything. summer break. If he hasn't performed, I think that's there's when you, a realistic chance that he might get a boot. Yeah. So, hate saying it, but last point on the not this. five. You know, we talked about it um, a few minutes ago, but just. All those pit stop errors, it was all on those rear left you tires. Work. I, there's someone did the breakdown where it's like the guy who just pushes up the car. That guy's See, the getting, jack man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The jack man is, works for two minutes consecutively on the like, a race. And and he's like, like doing actual work and he makes like 100000 Yep. That guy's, dude, they're, they're Bro, actual athletes. Just, they're literal they're athletes. Actual. <laughs> Dude, those the guys are athletes. I'm not. They're high. Ki- they're high performance athletes. You don't understand. Geet, they have to pro- I'm high performance <laughs> athlete. Keep, keep, yeah. <laughs> Come on, you're getting paid all this money. You practice this hundreds of thousands of times. I feel like you would be doing this to the like to the point where you could do it while like drinking tea. Yeah. Well, it's just the fact that it 
sure, maybe a one-off at McLaren, but it happened twice at Sauber. Yeah, which in, is in, <laughs> at one race a, twice. A big issue, and like you know, Ferrari has their uh, hey, don't bring famed them in. issue. Hey, don't bring them into this. They were stellar this weekend. Maybe make a leave them alone. Maybe make a cushion protector that doesn't fold in on itself. All right, dude. That, <laughs> that was a. I mean, that's just a weird picture, but I'll let you uh, take it away with some F2 stuff. I was going to say, yeah, a good F, F1 weekend, but F2 was uh, was equally interesting to watch this weekend. Highlights so were good. Highlights, highlights were, good. were phenomenal. We watched uh, the highlights after um, after the F1 race yesterday. I watched the entire F2 sprint race uh, as a whole. But, yeah, so qualifying for the race, Oliver Behrman, as you know, took pole position for that race. But the way in which he did it was pretty pretty immaculate. Um, he, in his first run in the, the final part of qualifying, he set the benchmark time. Nobody topped it. Um, Kush Miney was the person who came the closest uh, to taking that from him. But he, he messed up his final run. Um, and nobody improved their times. So he was able to go out with one run in essentially Q3 um, and set a pole time. And he'd pull like a Sebastian Vettel Singapore, go sit in the garage while everybody else does another lap. Um, Kimi Antonelli was the highest placed rookie in qualifying, which I know a lot of people will be happy about. But with Oliver Merriman being taken out for the weekend, going to Ferrari, um, Every single spot in qualifying, where everybody qualified, they were all pushed up one place. Um, So for the sprint race, with how that works, it's the reverse grid top 10. So P11 um, moved to P11 P11 down. You know, they all stayed the same. Um, And then P9 to P1 got pushed up. So I can't remember who that promoted to pole position, but it was a pretty quiet race. Um, Richard (laughs) Vashore. Richard Vashore won the race for Van M. Forst, which was so funny because um, it's a Dutch team and Richard Vashore is a Dutch driver. So a lot of people were saying, you know, I, you know, I, I thought I'd watch F2 this weekend to oh, escape the Dutch national anthem. And lo and behold, you get a Dutch driver winning for a Dutch team. Um, <laughs> but it was very short lived. Uh, Richard Vashore was actually disqualified after the race for a technical breach of the regulations, gifting the win to Dennis Hauger, Red Bull Jr. Um, Now, this is not the first time that this has happened. Richard Vashore has been disqualified from a P1 finish in F2 before, and it kind of feels like his trademark now. Um, But it was good for Dennis Hauger. Uh, Then in in the main race... You had Enzo Fittipaldi absolutely dominating that race, winning from Cushmine and Dennis Hauger. Um, but I think the the main thing that was so cool about that race was there was a there was a late safety car, so the field was very close towards the end, and you had P three and P five separated by 0.15 seconds. Like it was a three car Lightning McQueen car style photo the finish with out. the tongue out. Like it was very cool. Um, but Pepe Marty was also noted for having a pretty wild spin in the first chicane of the feature race as well. He knocked a couple drivers out. Um, he came over the radio saying somebody hit him, but he had actually just spun himself. And unfortunately, you know, in that, in that chicane, drivers are just going to spear into you. It's the, it's the first, first lap. Nobody lap. has anywhere no to go. No space. Everyone's going forward. Um, but it was it was a very action packed weekend for F two and you know just like Bahrain overtakes almost every single lap but the the inexperience and youth really does show with these drivers um, like another very notable point was um, in both races you had drivers stalling on the grid um, which obviously you don't see in F one and F two cars are started. Uh, differently than F1 cars. It's much easier to stall an F2 car than it is to stall an F1 car. But you had multiple cars in the races stalling on the grid, having to be pulled back to the pit lane and then come out of the pits after, you know, a safety car and stuff. So that was um, very interesting to see because, you know, you'd think they'd iron this kind of stuff out. But they're young. You know, these are 16 to 18-year-olds. So, you know, there's a lot of learning to do for them. But it was a really cool race weekend, so I'm super happy with it. Nothing to for rally until the end of the month. 
Weck, we got Imola, April 21st, 6 a.m. is the next event, so that's very exciting. I believe it is the six hours yes. of Italy? Yes, six, six hours, hours of Italy. Of Italy. Um, and then I will say we had the opening race for the NTT IndyCar Series, Yay! which is your your number one American racing championship for open wheelers. Obviously, I'm pretty sure NASCAR is more popular, but um, in America, yes. Yeah. So we had the opening weekend this weekend at St. Pete uh, in Florida. It's a really cool track. It's built. Um, it's kind of like a street circuit and. Um, it uses an old runway strip, kind of like Silverstone does uh, in F1. Um, but it's a very, very cool uh, track. But Joseph Newgarden absolutely dominated this race weekend, um, taking pole position, winning the race, taking the fastest lap. Um, it was very, very cool to see. Um, you had Aero McLaren and McLaren F1 development driver Pato Award finishing second. He definitely challenged um, Joseph Newgarden throughout the race, but... It, you just didn't have enough to get past him. And then you had Scott McLaughlin also with Team Penske along with Newgarden rounding out the podium in P3. It was not too hectic of a race. Um, you had, I'd, I'd say the biggest crash type incident was Marcus Armstrong kind of throwing it into a wall like Lance Stroll. He kind of tapped a wall, slid across the track and smacked into another wall. Um, but, you know, there's 27 cars in this field instead of 20 in F1. So you're going to get a lot more of uh, a lot more on track action, which is really nice. But there was plenty of overtaking opportunities. There's a lot of hard braking zones on this on this track, a lot of long straights. It's probably top three, four um, tracks in IndyCar for me. So it was super cool to watch. Moving over to MotoGP. That We're race. finally started yeah. in MotoGP. That race started today in early morning. Oh, I'm going to butcher this name. Francesco Baganaya won the race after leading for most. Kind of having a short battle there with Brad Binder and the Red Bull KTM and Jorge Martin for Promac Racing. Coming in second and third respectfully. But they all were within two seconds of each other. So it was a pretty good race. Uh, you had Mark Maxquez coming in with coming in fourth with his Ducati debut uh, with it. some I, great <laughs> great risk management. Yeah, I don't know what that is, but um, no, it, it's it's cool to see. You'd have to tell me this, Raven. You've studied it more than I have, but it seems like MotoGP is much more of a spec type series given there's less engineering that goes into the less, cars there's a lot less engineering there's D ducati is the main one mm -hmm. then you have red bull ktm and then you have yamaha as well yamaha had a terrible showing at this race and okay a lot of people are kind of questioning where they're at and where they're going to be moving it's similar i that's where i don't i don't know if i've watched enough to really make a comparison to how the spec of the car, the yeah. bikes are, but <clears throat> I mean, these I, I'm just wondering, you know, what is base, and then you know what gets you know worked on team to team. I mean, I think it is aerodynamics is one of those things that go team yeah. to team. Um, but then it's really like you know, with how small a motorcycle is, how much aerodynamic differential can you have not between very teams? Much. Like that's what I'm thinking. I think it's like intake points and shape, because like, like maybe different diffusers that yeah, kind of thing. And like another yeah. thing is the drivers themselves are a part of the aerodynamics. It's like that's they, true. They yeah, you have see to that, be that kind of stuff focused in as a point of that too. So a lot of these bikes are kind of more designed for the driver. Yeah, where it's not like a one bike fits all. It's like I can get on someone's bike and totally be fine. It's, I'll not, probably it's, not, it's be not a road little, bike. Yeah, it's yeah. not a road bike at all. But really good race. Excited for that. I believe the next one's either in two weeks or three weeks. So we will get back to that. But is there any uh, other things you would like to get at? Don't forget the name Oliver Behrman. That kid has a bright future ad. Yeah. So I think that's going to be it for us. This was our first nighttime recording. Sorry if we sound a little tired. I was up at... It's a cold, cold Sunday night out here. It is. I was up at crack of dawn going to work and then doing finals. Daylight savings here. time. Daylight Screws. savings. Screw Daylight savings. Everyone sleepover. over. Please, so. please, people, get some good sleep. 
tonight's end. Hopefully you got some yesterday, which is when we are recording this. But hey, Raven so, and I are going to go do that now. The oh yeah. tank is absolutely empty, but just we wanted like to chug cars, this episode out just for like you Just like all the cars. Just like all the cars. But... Wanted we to pump will. this episode out for you guys. I'm hoping the lighting is also better for y'all yeah, as well. Just some because they're complaining about the kitchen, so there's no kitchen. No you get a blank kitchen. Wall. We'll you get just some get the outline of the gorgeous chandelier we have above us. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll still set working up. We're gonna make this look nice. We're gonna get some decorations of general sports F1 stuff. We and just want you to be able to see our faces. Yeah, we just want to be able to do some video, and you know. I'll throw it out there that the talks of us going to the Canadian GP is becoming more and more real. And we are also attempting to go to Europe and go to a Hungarian race there. Hungarian GP? Hungarian, Belgian GP? Maybe Spa? We don't know. We can see. We could also just see if we could sneak in a little rally event. I would. Oh, I would. I love don't even to care do if it's main like Group A rally. I would be doing some. I'd, like, go, I'd see any of that. I would go to Poland just to see some. Dude, I'd go and watch the British cars. Touring Car Championship. Like I don't care. <laughs> all right, everyone, go <laughs> check out races. Go check out all the other shows on Alethio. We'll be back tomorrow, or I'll be back tomorrow with Tassos doing some Good Morning Hockey, and I'll see you guys next week. We'll be back next week. Enjoy yourself and uh, try to have a good week. Absolutely. Good vibes. Have a great week, you guys. Bye, everyone.